Welcome to Everything Business Consulting, a podcast dedicated to business consulting success. It's for those of you who are already a business consultant to want to improve your skills. Or you may be an accountant and want to offer consulting services to your clients. You're an ex-corporate maybe who wants to get out of the rat race and become a self-employed business consultant. Or you've owned a business before and now want to use the skills that you've learned to help others in business. I'm David Thexton. And I'm Julius Bloom. Everything Business Consulting is brought to you by ConsultX, a global business consulting company that has everything that you require to become a successful business consultant or offer consulting services in your existing professional firm. If you'd like to find out more, visit consultix.com. Today, we're going to be reintroducing the podcast after a long hiatus. I've joined the Everything Business Consulting team, and I've been a business consultant with Consultex for the last three years, so I do have a bit of experience and some stories to share. However, I'm here to learn and tease out as much information from David as I can. Now, David, what is Everything Business Consulting all about? It's a weekly podcast that will be released every Wednesday US time and will be packed with really interesting information about anything and everything business consulting. There will be interviews with consultants, business owners and other professionals that can help you to be a better business consultant. And we'll look into case histories of business consultants from Consultex's global network as well as how they've been able to achieve success for their clients. No stone will be left unturned as we dive into every imaginable area of business consulting. If there's anything you want to hear about business consulting or any ideas, questions maybe that you have, then I suggest you send us a message on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter and also tune in to us on YouTube we'll be posting up bonus content including videos and helpful hints. Now in today's episode I'm going to start with some fundamental questions about business consulting. David are you ready? Yes ready to go. Fantastic well our first question we're going to start at the absolute start what is business consulting? Well, it's been around for about 150 years, and it started in the Industrial Revolution, mainly in the United States, where where railroads were going everywhere and trains were being built. It was prior to the motor car. Anyway, um, people started becoming experts about various things involving railroads, and they became a business consultant, and that's where it started. And the and, railroads. Yes, yeah, because th- that was the biggest, prior to the Industrial Revolution and motor vehicles coming along and motorbikes and aeroplanes, railroads were the way that people moved, or as well as horse and carts, around the United States. So it was so complex, and it was so involved, and it was a technical leading edge, like we, like we talk about a, an Apple Watch and what it can do today and how fabulous it is well railroads for their apple watch kind of thing back in those days so it started back there and it got it got more and more popular and and it it actually became a profession way back then 140 150 years ago and of course now it's in every business um, of a large scale today um, uses business consultants to help them in all sorts of different ways Uh, some of these business consultants are specialists some of them some of them are generalists and they do all sorts of businesses and it's really only been in the last few years that that business consultants have started to move down into the smaller businesses where it's kind of uh, entry level kind of thing because the, their their skills and their systems and their processes are really useful for business owners to 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 use and to help them to build a better business well, I didn't realise how old the profession was. I, I suppose I'd never thought about it. But what exactly does a traditional or, or a, a normal business consultant do? Could you go into that a little bit? Yeah, traditional is the right word because what what happened, and this is what I found about 15 years ago. You know, I went to Spain to learn how to be a consultant. Well, I was learning to be um, what they call a consultant who does projects and assignments. 
and that's what they typically do. And what that means is that most of the jobs, they're short term. It might be, I've got a big um, human resources problem in my company, I've got 500 staff and, and all these bad things are going on. So um, a consultant who is an expert in HR would come in, help that business owner, scope out the problem, quote them for fixing the problem or providing fixes for the problem, do the assignment, present it to them, get paid and go. That's traditional. And we don't do that. We think there is a better way. Ah, so, so the traditional one, that's the, the hunt and kill, as you call it, or, or yeah. almost an in and out yes. type of methodology. Yes. Okay, and what's this better way that you, you think you've come up with? Well, for the first year that I did consulting, after I've been to Spain and been trained to, to do traditional consulting, um, I spent the first year uh, working with, uh, I had nine clients in the first year, and, um, and they were oh, from about two million to about 36 million dollars turnover and and I did um, well basically traditional consulting where I scoped out what their problems were and teased it out of them and then I did work with them and the owner and the team and I did a business plan for them with all of the implementation um, steps that they needed to do to make it work for them gave it to them I got paid and I left just to stop you there, so you said you solved their problems. Were you working in a kind of a specific area of consulting, or how was everywhere, that work? everywhere? I, I, because I'd owned a business before, and I'd helped a lot of friends in the nineteen nineties with problems their businesses had. Um, I was able to just about do anything. And the thing was, if I didn't know something, I know where to look. And that's the important thing. As a, as a consultant, you can't know everything. They say a good consultant is not, not a consultant that knows everything, but he's a consultant who knows where to look or who to ask. Oh, okay. Hmm. Yeah. So I discovered after doing all that assignment and project work, I went back to see them six to nine months later, and shock horror, I discovered that nobody had implemented all of the implementation steps or tasks that we put together and i felt like a bit of a sham and i tried i pedaled like hell to get in as their implementation guy and they wouldn't let me in it was like a a strange strange situation so are you saying that they paid you to come in and help them solve some problems yeah and they never solved the problems or you solved them but they never did anything as a group we solved them me the owner and two or three senior managers we solved them and then I fashioned it into a business plan and then distilled it down to a number of tasks or steps or actions um, which they had to do. And it was the doing of those actions that never got done. So I realized at the end of that year that, that um, this was a big problem. I went around and saw them, as I said, and they wouldn't let me back in again. So the next year I thought, um, I'm not going to do this again. I don't like this. I feel like a sham. So what I did was over Christmas, I, t- I wrote the business success program because I discovered in that first 12 months that to be successful in this form of business consulting that Consultix does, I had to be with them all the way. I had to be the implementation guy. And, and that was written into the program. And that's what everybody does now, all the people that we train because you've got to follow it through. You've got to make sure that they implement the decision, the steps or tasks that, that everybody's decided that they're going to do. So you become a bit of a, gosh, you've been, I suppose there's a bit of coaching, there's a bit of mentoring, there's a bit of discipline in some cases to make these things happen because if those tasks are not achieved or completed, then the business is not gonna reach its goal or its vision that it wants to get, get towards. So you kind of suggest going from a consultant almost to a, I don't know what the word is, an improvement manager or or someone that creates the change within this business. Yes, yes, yes. It helps, encourages, mentors, as I said, a little bit of discipline sometimes. Because like from between, let's say we had a business, just give you an example, and we wanted to increase their revenue 500%, five times, and and that it was doing $2 million, so we want to be $10 million in five years, as, as far as revenue is concerned, then, <clears throat> excuse me, there's probably, I don't know, but probably 300 tasks that need to be done between year one, or year zero of the start, 
and the end of the fifth year. So it's your job. What, what's five years? Why do you say the fifth year? That's what we normally work towards as a vision or a goal. When we're talking with clients, we say, where do you want to be personally in five years? Where do you want to be business in five years? Where do you want your business to be? So it's very easy. We could, we could leave them with a business plan that had, had 300 tasks in it, <laughs> about this big. But, but that doesn't work. It'd be even worse than before. So we pick out the most important tasks. And a lot of these tasks are sequential or chronological as well. They've got to be done spaced out in time and they've got to be done in the right sequence. So we would only hand out to the owner and his team maybe 10, 10 tasks at a time and we wouldn't hand out any more until we completed or they completed those, those tasks. It's like a whole lot of steps to get to the five years. Hmm. And each year it's increasing in revenue by around about $2 million or something like that. Okay, and before you talked about going into these businesses to solve a problem or a series of problems that they're having is that essentially what a consultant does they work with a business to solve problems or do they do other things as well mainly to solve problems and mainly to delegate the tasks of solving these problems to the members of the team and yes we do some things we do we produce reports we we help get the accounts together. We need to have monthly accounts to be able to measure the improvement um, and things like that. So we probably spend about eight hours a month approximately of our time working on the business and all of the major tasks get delegated to the owner and his team or an outside person. Like we, we, we believe in not plucking the chicken as we call it. What do you mean by that? Plucking the chicken is doing a menial task that that is only worth 20 or 30 bucks an hour. Like if we need a bookkeeper, we bring a bookkeeper. Oh, the poor for, chicken. Yeah, poor chicken and, uh, and things like that. So, so don't pluck the chicken. It's tempting and you get caught in a trap. Um, if you start doing low paid jobs at a $25, $30 an hour, then you're going to get stuck in there. Uh, your job is the person who does the business plan with the help of the owner and his team help, and also um, delegates and hands out the tasks and then manages that, uh, making sure that these tasks are completed. And why can't the business owner do this himself? Hasn't been trained. Business owner's got a license to run a business from the government for $200 and he's very good at making, for well, example... What, what do you mean by that? He gets a license from the government. Well, everywhere around the world, if you want to own a business, you've got to go to the government and get a, a license to operate. And it costs about $200. Ah, oh, like, like incorporating a business, that's what you're talking about? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. I and, understand um, and, um, and in New Zealand uh, and Australia, it takes about 20 minutes on the internet. It costs $175 in Australia. And you, all of a sudden, you're in business. Now, there's no exam and there's no training. So... Do, Compare that to a driver's license, for example. They don't just give you a driver's license. Oh, you've got to do tests and you've got to read a book and you, you yeah, go and through you've the got theory and the practical. Practical, all those sorts of things. But to, to operate a business and start a business, um, you don't have to do any of that. you just got to have $200 in your pocket. Why is that? Do they assume that you should be trained already if you're starting a business? I don't know. I've never spoken to anybody in government and it's always been that way and I, I just don't know. But I know that the business marketplace out there worldwide is full of people who don't know how to run a business. They might be able to make a kitchen or they might be a printer or whatever their business actually does and they do that very, very well but they don't know how to run a business and this is why the failure in business is, is 60% in the first five years and then another 20% in the next five years which means there's an 80% failure rate over 10 years. So you mean... Eight out of ten businesses don't even make it to the ten-year mark. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And in a couple of countries, it's worse. It's about eighty-five percent. Wow. That's uh, that's that's really really bad odds. And I imagine that's pretty intimidating going into business. Do do these business owners or people that start out do they not know this sort of thing? No, and they certainly don't understand it. And they and they go into business because they want to do for several reasons. They want to do better than they were on wages or a salary. They want. Uh, they see family members starting business and building uh, nice houses and nice car and buying nice cars. They see all these sorts of things going on, friends, family members, other people, and they think, "I want to do this," and that's fine. But, but those people that I just mentioned, 
they haven't done any training and haven't done the exams or anything on running a business and they don't know either. And uh, so the marketplace, and it's millions and millions around the world of business owners who don't actually know what to do. And that's a big problem, but it's a big, it's a big opportunity for us. And that's our Consultec system is built to be able to work with business owners like that to, to help them to identify the problems and challenges that they have in their business. And then once we know what the, those problems or challenges are, we can help them to solve those because we've got the program to do that and they don't. So that's the, the, that's the huge opportunity out there. Uh, so that, that sounds really negative, David, like there's all of this business failure going on and it sounds like most businesses, the reason you actually get in there is because they're having problems. How do you approach a business owner and start the conversation to work with them if, if it's such a negative situation? Well, it's negative, but a lot of them don't see that it's negative. They think it's just normal and it's not. How do you approach them? Um, we have a system that we use where we, where we ha just have a talk with them, just a fireside chat. I've heard it described as, and, and it's kind of like a bit of counseling and a bit of coaching, and we just talk to them and find out what's really going on. Because if, the, if you can get them to tell the truth, then they'll tell you all sorts of things and they'll even tell you things that you don't want to know. But anyway, that's <laughs> how, a different story. How do you get them to tell the truth? Just by... Well, how do you know they're telling the truth? Oh, it'll start to, it'll start to piece together as you're talking it through. Um, we, we have a series of questions that we ask them and that encourages them to tell the truth because they're all linked together, these questions, and one question leads on to the next one and the next one. And... Um, yeah, we just want them to tell the truth. But you gotta you gotta build up their confidence and their trust because if they don't trust you, then they won't open up. And if they do trust you, they will. And if they realise that you're not threatening, they realise that anything they tell you is confidential and all those sorts of things and you're there to help, then you'll have no trouble getting them to open up and tell you everything that you need to know. So you've got to build a bit of rapport then with it with them it sounds like now is this is this the consulting you're talking about is that different at all to the more corporate style consultants that are out there yes it is because typically their project are assignment based that's how that is how they are and they i i've heard of um, um i'll give an example i've heard of a, a consulting job that was television new zealand about 18 years ago television new zealand wanted a charter because that they they're a government owned enterprise and they wanted a charter and they wanted to improve increase the maori percentage of of uh, what was going on in our new zealand television you see so a, a consultant for, for our listeners around the world that's our indigenous people here in new yes, zealand yes that's true and uh, so they hired a a consultant i won't say what company they were from but it starts with d and he came down from Singapore and uh, he came down here and he was down here for three weeks and he, he worked with them and he did the charter and he gave it to them. It's all on one a sheet of A4 paper, $750,000 for three weeks work. Wow. That's now that's project money. or assignment base because he did, he, was, he did a project. Um, and um, yeah, so, so that's what they should do. The big guys and the big companies typically do that. We work long term. And we believe that that um, that sure we can do things like that if we if we want to, or it could be part of a five-year consulting project. It could be an extra additional service over and above the normal consulting service that we provide. We can do those sorts of things. So why why do you focus on the long term rather than doing the um, the short term in and out type? The short work? term is kind of erratic and jagged. If you imagined a graph, you got a client, you haven't. You got a client, you haven't. Mm. That sort of thing. And I think it's more useful. Um, it's more useful working with them over five years or more, because because you can you can help them to increase on a nice incremental, gradual basis towards, as we said before, five times increase of the company's size over a longer period of time. And that's better for us, it's better for us. Why is it better for us? 
Well, from an earning capacity, because every year our fees get a little bit higher, we get to know them very well, our relationship and trust goes through the roof, and, and we're able to see, see in black and white what the improvement of the business actually is, because we have two meetings per month after they've become a client where we measure tasks and where we measure the the results of the business, the key performance indicators and the financials, we measure it about two weeks after the end of the month. So it's very gratifying. It's like you're it's like you're a shareholder but you're not. It's like you're a partner of the business but you're not. It's really good. Well I can see how that would be really rewarding. When you work with a business owner, what's your kind of objective when you're working with them? Just to fix their problems or You've got other things as well. Well, no, it's bigger than that because one of the things we do in the early days is we organise a personal vision for them. Because it all starts with personal because owning a business is a personal thing. Like it's generally it's the family's biggest asset and generally that's where all the money comes from to, to, to run the family and to improve their personal wealth and things. So we start with the 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 personal vision and we look at it over five years. Where do you want to be in five years' time? Oh, I want to have a house on the river and I want this and I want to have the, the latest Holden Commodore or whatever it is. And, and we scope all this together and then we come back to today and we put milestones in place. Do you want to build the house in the third year, get the car in the first year, and, and lots of other things. So kind of coming up with a, a, a plan or a roadmap of where they yes, want. Yes, a yep. roadmap is a good way to describe it. And we do that, and that gives us the personal, and then that tells us what they need slash want over the next five years to be able to deliver the vision that they want in their personal vision. So then we can do a business vision. We can say, well, in order to buy that that million dollar house on the river, um, you're going to be able to. You need to earn this amount of profitability out of your business, and then we start putting together the business plan of what milestones we need to achieve over the five years to get to get to the um, the vision at the end, um, and then we start linking it all together. So what we've done is taken a business that's a personal family asset, and we have found out what the owners, the husband and wife, want to do with the business, linked it back to the business, and then we put the business plan together. And that's what makes it so powerful, because, because a business is not just dollars and cents. It's it's actually it's a personal thing it's a it's a living kind of living breathing entity government licensed entity that provides things for the owners of the business and of course as they're getting older and it and it moves towards retirement and things like that it becomes even more important now nobody does this with business owners i never come across anybody why why not they just don't they just don't there there are accountants out there and they do a few numbers there are lawyers out there, are they lawyering, there are coaches out there. Nobody does what what we actually do. And that's what makes it so powerful doing our style of, of consulting is that um, we're not in and out in a month or two months or something. Um, we're there for the long term. And like I said, we've got some some business owners that have been with our consultants for nine years and still continuing on. Wow, that's a, that's a really, really long time. Mm, it is. At the bottom line of it, like at the really, really at the, at the bottom line of this, we help businesses to increase their profit, to increase their growth. And if we do those two things, and, and, and if it works, then it will increase the value of the business, which is a calculation of those other two things. Profit, growth, and value is what we're there for. Wow, you hear that? Profit, growth, and value. That's, yeah. uh, that's some what a golden nugget, I guess, right mm, there, mm. that... Um, that little phrase. So how do you deliver on this promise to help them improve the profit growth and if those two work, the business value? Well, we've got to find out the problems, as I mentioned earlier on, the problems or the challenges. So we find out the problems and the challenges and we help them to solve them. Because when you have meetings with the owner and two team members, generally the answer is already in the room and we just facilitate that meeting. Do you only have two team members? Oh, it could be four. Depends how big the company is. Oh, I, okay. I had yep. a client that had 13. Well, wow. I think it was too many. But uh, but, it, but it was okay. It worked. It worked just as, as well. We could have done with five. Would have been would have been okay. But anyway, we had 13. So it's totally up to you and who needs to be there and where you think and the owner thinks the answers are going to come from. 
because your team members know the answers to what the problems are. They're not unique and, and they know what the problems are and they'll tell you and they'll also tell you what the answers are. If but that's it, the case, why don't they solve them themselves? Or they why don't, don't do it. Why don't, don't they take it to the business owner? Because they're too busy working. And, and nobody ever gets them all together in one room and mines all the information out of their heads. It's all there. You, you'll be in a meeting and there'll be a 24, 23-year-old guy there, or girl, doesn't matter, and, and they'll come up with the most brilliant idea, like a multi-million dollar idea. And, and, um, but, but she or he wouldn't have said anything prior to you facilitating that kind of meeting. Ah, so, so if I get this correctly, you're talking about working with these businesses and, and basically becoming the manager of profit growth and business value? Yes, and, and I've been to many, many companies over my business career and I've never seen a door in a, in a company saying, Jimmy Smith, manager of profit, growth and business value. Oh, I don't there's think I have either, that. no. No, there's nobody does that. And that's what we do because they're all busy doing their own thing and they're in their own departments and all of that sort of thing and they're working hard and everything, but nobody is ultimately responsible for it. And that's what we're responsible for. Well, that sounds like a very full-on role. How busy would someone be and how many clients would they be able to handle with, with, with that sort of work? The highest number of clients in the network has been 22 and the lowest has been about three. But um, we have semi-retirement people in, in our network who only got three or four or five and that's absolutely fine. That's you can have, network. you can be the manager of profit, growth and business value in 22 different businesses. Yeah, because the system's leveraged and it's been specifically put together to, to provide as many automated or semi-automated parts to the consulting program that would maximize your time and, and the number of clients you want to handle. Wow, that sounds like you'd be doing a lot of plate spinning there. Yeah, you would. But the thing is, they don't know how many clients you've got because you don't tell them. They think you're their, uh, they are, are your only client. They think that. They, they know it's not true, but that's the effect that we give. We don't have an annual... Um, you try and make them feel that way. Yes, on purpose, on purpose. So that they, yeah, because it's just the best thing. Like if they ring you, you pick the phone up straight away and, and you talk to them every week or even twice a week with emails and newsletters and things. They think that they are your only client, but you might have 20. Wow, okay. Well, that's that's very, very interesting. That sounds mm. like, um, it sounds like the earning potential if you had 20 clients, like that would be fantastic. Yeah, but you need a system like ours to be able to manage it. And, and that was what I, I found. I had 18 clients at the highest point. And I found that I, I was in constant fear of sitting in, a, sitting in a meeting at the clients at a cosmetic company and asking how the steak pies were going. You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, true, because there's lots going on in, uh, in, in our heads. So you need a, your own system, which is our system, which is their system. You need your own system to work on so you know where you are. And, and, and it's all written down. It's on your laptop and all that sort of thing. You don't want to say, how's the steak and mushroom flavored lipstick going or something? No, like that. no, no. I, I never did that. But I did. I, I did. I, I, I understand the, the, um, the sort of situation that can occur. Because if you're not thinking, if you don't have a, a, your own railway line to run on, right, I'm sitting at the cosmetic company, they've just launched an organic range of products and we spoke about that last month. Like before you go into the meeting, you sit out in the car and just look at your notes and things like that um, so that you're, you're right on it and um, rather than making a mistake like that. Very good. Well, I'm going to change gear a little bit, David, and I'm sure. going to ask you a question a bit more about the type of person that would like to become, uh, could become a consultant? What do they typically look like and what sort of skills do they normally have? Look like everything. They look like everybody. There's no, there's no person type. Um, what skills do they have? Um, they come from every walk of life. Um, we have young, young people um, like yourself, um, who was probably the youngest, I was thinking, probably the youngest that we've ever had. Because you join when you're about 25. Yeah, that's right. 25. Yeah. Uh, and we have people that are older that are semi-retired in their in their 70s and early 80s with a lot of wisdom and a lot of a lot of ideas and their minds still 
still as sharp as a tack, but they might have a limp, you know, <laughs> something like that. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't matter. So yeah, so so, but people who also people who like people, like you have to you have to get on well with people. You have to be able to form a relationship, and you have to be able to get their trust. So you've got to be a person that that uh, kind of exudes trust um, or belief. Uh, and uh, because th th they have to trust you, they give you all of their financial information. Like you, you and the owner have got the steering wheel of the business and things like that. And yeah, so so and you have to, I think, also uh, want to help business owners. That's Absolutely. important too. Do you, yeah, yeah. And I did, as I mentioned earlier, in the nineties. Um, I used to, every two weeks I used to have a breakfast with friends of mine, and they're all about five or ten years behind me in business, and. And um, I used to have, I can only call them mentoring sessions because they had lots of good ideas too, but, but I was 10 years ahead of them. And um, so I was able to give them a bit more advice than what they could probably give because they hadn't been in business for very long. So, so yeah, a lot of people that join us, we, we've got people that joined us from the Mentor Society, from all sorts of places, um, people who involved with kind of like the Lions and the JCs and the, all those sort of rotary clubs and things like that who like helping people and putting back all sorts of people. There's no, I can't give you one avatar and, and have a model of him or her and stand in there because you'd be, you'd be just blown away. And there's no professions or anything like that that stand out? No, none stand out. I've had a vacuum cleaner salesman, accountants, lawyers, real estate, ex-business owners, goes on and on ex-army generals um, wow yeah policemen that'd be yeah. that order you around a little bit <laughs> <laughs> no not really uh school teachers school principals um and the list goes on it's from everywhere well one of the reasons that i wanted to become a consultant was was and you know this because I really like to help people and see people succeed. So that was yeah. a, a driving factor for me. Are there any other reasons or, or typical things you hear on why other people like to become business consultants? Well, some it's for the money. Some it's for helping people. Uh, some it's because they want to put back. They might have owned a business and they might have struggled a bit in that business and they've sold it and they want to do something else. Some might be accountants and they have seen firsthand lots of business clients in their accounting firm and, and what does and can go wrong and they want to go further than that uh, all sorts of reasons Julius it's um and there's no one and sometimes there's bundles of reasons some of those things we just talked about are bundled mm. together and um, yeah oh, some people want to get out of corporate some people hate their boss some people being made redundant some people some people are not being promoted and they've been stuck in that one place for years and then all of a sudden somebody else gets promoted above them and, the, and they consider oh, that, no. that person to be you know very very uh, inferior to what they are you know from a knowledge point of view bad things happen so when you promote somebody in a firm you've got to be careful you don't start a domino effect no you wouldn't want that well, one of the other reasons that i wanted to become a consultant was i guess for the lifestyle mm. and and for me i'm an absolutely avid surfer mm. and today is actually looks like there's a good wind blowing but the, the way that surfing works is it doesn't care whether it's the weekend or not it only happens when there's the right swell and there's the right weather patterns yeah. and mm. the right wind and that sort of thing and I wanted the ability to be able to go to the beach in the middle of the week or something like that if the winds and the, and the weather were mm. in the right situation so that's something that really sort of resonated with me well that brings up the point you um going on from what I said before lifestyle is another reason um, some some people want to pick the kids up from school and take them to school some want to be able to go to there might be a, uh, a school exercise going on um, and they might want to turn up for that or a sports day or all those sorts of things that they can't currently do some people are stuck in traffic like some of the traffic stories that I hear are horrific especially overseas in Asia and in the United States although Auckland's not much better anyway where you can be an hour and a half getting to work and and if, and if there's a traffic if it's an accident it could be two and a half hours getting to oh, work oh i you couldn't know. deal with that all those sorts of things go, and it's only going to get worse it's getting in auckland for example sydney's just as bad as auckland but in auckland my daughter uh, used to live out in the southern suburbs where we are and um, typically it takes a 90 minutes to get to work 
and then and then if there's an accident or something goes wrong it could be two hours to get to work two hours to get home that's four hours a day there's five days in a week five fours are 20 it's 20 hours a week sitting in a car on the motorway 20 hours times 48 can't work it out that sounds like a lot and it sounds like it's about it's seven or eight hundred hours wow. seven or eight hundred hours stuck in a car on the motorway they want to get out of that so you work from as a consultant you work from your own home you typically work within about a 10 or 15 kilometer or 10 mile radius of where you live um, you do that you make the appointments when you want to make them um, you decide what days you're going to be working on like your clients don't know what you're doing they only know what you do for them and then, and, and as I've said you're you're um, sending them newsletters every week you might be phoning in the week that you don't see them or you don't meet with them um, you'll be sending them stuff emailing stuff white papers uh, all sorts of things newspaper articles it's relevant to their business and on and on it goes so you don't normally work at the client's place of business no 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 you don't you you, you can do um, you can have meetings there and things like that but you can work from home you might um, because of traffic and because of the um, things that go on nowadays you might you might have one meeting a month at their place uh, or, but but people, because of the virus and the lockdowns globally, they're getting really used to using Zoom and things like that, where you can have meetings um, and the people can be everywhere. Boy, there's so many companies in New Zealand that, um, that we're somewhere around about half of their staff are now working from home. Mm. Well, I think you know, David, that, um, that even before the virus hit, I was able to do some remote consulting when I was traveling through oh, Southeast Asia yes. and Europe. But that's that's a long story, so we can go into that in uh, perhaps the next episode. But is there anything else you'd like to tell our listeners before we part ways? Um, really, um, if you're listening to this podcast and you identify with some of the things that we're talking about, then just shoot me an email and, and just put your hand up and... Uh, and we can start talking about it. It's a, it's a really lucrative, fantastic lifestyle. And um, if some of the things we've talked about resonate with you, then then we're just on the end of the email here, and you can uh, and you can send it send to us any any time that you like. In the same vein, if you if you do resonate with any of this stuff, please support this podcast and follow us on all of the major social media channels. And that's just going to help us to improve businesses and business consulting on a global scale everything business consulting is brought to you by consult x a global business consulting company that has everything you require to become a successful business consultant or offer consulting services in your existing professional firm if you'd like to find out more visit consultx.com and thank you for listening